is going to be covering DNA viruses. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the herpes virus. This video is really just jam-packed full of all the important information you need to know. Uh, so I believe if you watch this video through to its entirety, I really believe that you'll be able to answer pretty much any question that's thrown at you on any virus within the vir herpes category. So let's go ahead and get started. So here's the mnemonic that we're going to use to uh, help us recognize DNA viruses. So we're going to think of happy. So we've got two H's and three P's. Herpes, hepatinovirus, adenovirus, papovavirus, parvovirus, and poxvirus. So think happy. There's no Y here. but um, So we've got enveloped for herpes and hepatina and pox. And so right here I put HPH for enveloped and then adeno, hepova, and parvo are not enveloped. So we've got PAP right here. So the way we'll remember this is we'll think girls are naked when they get a PAP smear. So PAP right here, PAP. Okay, DNA virus is just a couple exceptions and general rules here. So transcription for the most part occurs in the nucleus except for the pox virus which occurs in the cytoplasm. And I've got a video coming up on the pox virus so you can watch that one. So this mnemonic makes more sense if you've seen that video but the way we are going to remember that is we're going to think that it's too big to get into the nucleus because one of the qualities of the pox virus is it's a very large virus. And then all DNA viruses consist of double-stranded DNA except for the parvovirus, which has single-stranded DNA. So the way we'll remember that is we'll think of, think of a buddy or a friend, and then you think he has never made a single par hole in his whole life. So we're going like the, with the golf mnemonic on that one. So single for single-stranded DNA, par for parvovirus. And then all DNA viruses consist of linear double-stranded DNA except for parvo, sorry, papovirus and hepatinovirus, which have circular. Okay, we're going to focus here on herpes. I did put pox in a brick box here, so the box is to help, help you remember that it's an enveloped virus. And the brick will come in um, later when I do the pox video. You'll see that. So we'll focus on herpes virus for the rest of this video. So we've got, we're going to talk about herpes simplex virus, which includes type 1 and type 2. And for type 1, we're going to have a broad generalization, and we're going to categorize this as above the waist. And for type 2, we're going to think below the waist. And the way we'll remember to distinguish type 1 from type 2 is we're going to think two balls for type 2, because it's always dealing with genital lesions. So two balls, two testicles. And then uh, we've got varicella zoster virus, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, cytomegalovirus, and HHV-8 or Kaposi's. Okay, so HSV type 1 above the, va the waist. So this is a useful way to remember um, to distinguish type 1 from type 2 as far as um, traits dealing with the the virus. So gingival, gingival stomatitis and um, keratoconjunctivitis, meningoencephalitis, and esophagitis in HIV patients. These are all things that are occurring above the waist. And then HSV type 2 is below the waist. It deals with genital infections, so we're thinking of two balls. Now I have a note here, little exception here. So since the neonate acquires the disease from the mother while passing through the birth canal, and that's called maternal genital herpes, neonate infections are usually type 2 regardless of whether the infection is in the skin, the eye, or the brain. So for example, above the waist, remember we typically think HSV1, so something like encephalitis is going to be in the brain, so that's HSV1. However, with the neonate, it's going to be HSV2 due to this rule I just talked about. Okay, so herpes simplex virus, some general ideas about the herpes simplex virus here, and then we'll 
be more specific and talk about HSV1 and HSV2 in the next couple slides. So it's the only virus to obtain their envelope by budding from the nuclear membrane, and it produces a latent virus. And HSV1 is going to be latent in the trigeminal ganglion, and HSV2 is going to be latent in the lumbar and sacral ganglion. Okay, HSV1, we're going to focus on the quality of gingival stomatitis for HSV1 on this slide. So HSV type 1 is sometimes called primary herpetic gingival stomatitis. So it may involve a primary infection, such as gingival stomatitis, or a recurrent infection, which is cold sores. And the first clinical manifestation of HSV1 is typically gingival stomatitis. HSV1 is associated with oral and ocular lesions. Remember, above the waist is HSV1. And then lesions often appear later as a, the familiar cold sore, usually at the mucocutaneous junction of the lips. So here's an example of how this might be phrased on a question. So a patient has a small has small ulcers all over their mouth, fever, and general malaise. And you'd have to know that this uh, is primary herpes or HSV type 1 gingival stomatitis. So um, another quality of HSV1 is it's often subclinical. So for the majority of individuals, the initial infection results in a subclinical disease. And many children have asymptomatic primary infections. And then, like we said already, HSV1 is latent in the sensory trigeminal ganglion, whereas HSV2 is the lumbar and sacral ganglion. Okay, moving on to HSV2. Uh, this is going to be genital herpes. Uh, has shown... And so you'll see two main things that we have to know, genital herpes, and then you'll see this idea of the cervix coming up a lot. So it has been shown to have a relationship to carcinoma of the cervix, can cause cervicitis, a candidate virus for the induction of cervical cancer or carcinoma. So you see that these are all different ways that you can be tested on the idea that HSV2 deals with uh, issues of the cervix. And if you think about it, we're, we're down in that region, right? Genital, herpes, the cervix, and the lumbar is pretty low down there too. Lumbar and sacral. Okay, varicella zoster. So this is going to cause two distinct diseases depending on the age group. So we've got chicken pox in the younger group and shingles in the older group. It's very contagious and spread by direct contact and respiratory droplets. Okay, we're going to talk about shingles here. It's usually unilateral, pain along a dermatome. It only occurs in individuals having a latent varicella zoster virus infection. And it's more common in individuals that are immunocompromised. So nothing too difficult here, but the main things we want to know is for sure like unilateral and pain along a dermatome. Those are typically the hallmark signs of shingles. Okay, we've got, I looked up how to pronounce this, uh, I already forgot, so, 